I now call upon the third group, which is on the world class infrastructure. May I request Gautam Kumra, Mr. Suman Sinha, Mr. Ms. Sangeeta Reddy, Arjun Sharma, Arjun Chaugule, and Chetan Maini to kindly come on the dais. Kumra will make the presentation. Kindly stick to the time. Honorable Prime Minister, Cabinet Ministers, Secretaries, and Friends, it's indeed a real honor and privilege to share with you some of our transformational ideas on how we can accelerate the development of world-class infrastructure in the country. So you have talked about a new India by 2022, the 75th year of our independence. In our group, we thought long and hard about what aspiration we should set by 2022 and what might be some of our transformational ideas to help get there. Next slide. We want to share with you three things. First, we want to talk to you a bit about our aspirations for 2022. We then want to share with you five transformational ideas that we think can make a dent. And then we want to close by outlining some areas where we need your help. Vision. As many of you know, I think we all know we badly need infrastructure investment in the country. Some of our estimates that many of you are aware, we need about $5 trillion of investment in India over the next 15 years. Our aspiration is that by 2022, we should aspire to invest at least 75 lakh crores in the infrastructure sector in India and if we do that, we see the opportunity to create 30 million jobs in this country. Today we have about 50 million people deployed in the infrastructure sector, and we see a tremendous opportunity to actually not only drive job creation, but create a completely different world-class infrastructure in the country 2022 and beyond. We just also like to outline four aspects of our vision for infrastructure in India. First was equity. I think we strongly felt that the infrastructure needs to be available to all different income segments and geographies in the country. Second, it has to be scalable. In turn, we talked, I talked about $15 to $5 trillion of investment by 2030, but also it has to include the participation of global capital and global world-class developers. Thirdly, it has to be sustainable. Sustainable not just environmentally, but also from an economic and return standpoint. And finally, innovation. So in your video, you talked about without innovation, we stagnate. And I think this could not be more true for infrastructure. Today, I think with technology and digital, we can build affordable housing at five times the rate faster than what has been done in the past. We can take advantage of new materials and technologies, such as digital, IoT. And as you have said many times before, we need to develop indigenous technologies to address our own problems. With that vision, I'd like to get to our first idea. Next. So the first idea, we're calling it Urja Se Unnati. This is transformation of the distribution system in India, a very thorny topic that many governments have made attempts, and I think including this government has made many promising steps. Our vision is to shift from a discount-centric industry to a consumer-centric electricity industry. Why is that important? Because electricity, as we know, is fundamental to triggering household income growth. We have five ideas for how to do it. First and foremost, we recommend that we enact the right to energy. In other words, the obligation to supply energy to every citizen of this country. And we recommend that we amend the Central Electricity Act and make that as an amendment in the Act. So that we have 24 by 7 energy available to all 1.2 billion people of India. Second, we recommend that all subsidies should be routed only through the direct benefit transfer route, a topic that I think the government is embracing. Thirdly, 
we recommend that we have an automatic monthly tariff adjustment mechanism because today the analyzed mechanism is heavily politicized and very difficult to execute and some mechanism that links energy pricing to fuel and our aggregate transmission and commercial losses. Fourth, we recommend that we implement a power supply portability system where the consumer can choose which supplier of power they would like to buy energy from. This has been done in telecom and in energy in many other markets in the world and we believe it is time now to privatize and open up the last mile access. And finally, by doing all of this, we hope to create a power retailer of the future where you will be able to take, leverage technologies of digital, combine multiple services, which is customer centric, and make consumer also a generator of electricity. So that's our first idea. Let me get to our second idea. Our second idea, we're calling it Vidyut Mala. Leveraging the green energy from the sea. The vision is to have 100 gigawatts in 10 years and 200 gigawatts in 15 years through offshore wind turbines. Why? Because we have unlimited resource available in the sea. It's affordable and it does not need land. A very difficult topic in India. How do we do this? We think we have the opportunity to leverage sea around the coastline and do a couple of things. Firstly, we see the opportunity to create these clusters and also combine it with grid scale batteries. So for example, to achieve our 100 gigawatt aspiration in 10 years, we envisage created, creating storage capacity of about 200 gigawatts hour. This can help us also with our Make in India vision. We believe India should not lose the battle to be a world factory when it comes to battery manufacturing. We should not lose that battle and I think this gives us the scale to enable that to happen. We see in addition an opportunity for 100 gigawatts hybrid floating solar on top of that. And finally, we think this can also be leveraged as the platform to accelerate water desalination in the country. So that's our second idea around Vidyat Mala. Our third idea, which initially I didn't know what this word Rasad meant, but uh, as we went on Google, we realized the word Rasad actually means logistics. Interestingly, and I think Rasad here stands for Rail, Sadak and Darya. I think we feel there is an opportunity and we should aspire to reduce the logistics cost of the country by 50%. Today, India's logistics cost is about 14% of GDP. Global average is 7%. Unless we reduce this dramatically, we do not have a hope to make manufacturing competitive in this country. Five ideas. First, seamless freight movement through integrated networks. Our modal mix today between road, raid, and sea is not optimal. Rail is being under leveraged, road is being overused, and sea is underutilized. We feel there's an opportunity for an integrated network planning to optimize this mix. Second, we believe there's an opportunity to increase the share of freight by sea dramatically, sea and inland by dramatically from abysmally low numbers to 50 to 20 percent in the next five years. We want to uberize freight transportation and create an open architecture where there is full transparency, data and information available on what infrastructure lies where so that private entrepreneurs and private players can actually piggyback on that data and information and better utilize, underutilize infrastructure and increase speed and reduce cost of logistics in the country. We believe rail needs reform as is happening. We would recommend separating rail infrastructure ownership and operations and encourage greater private sector participation in many aspects of the value chain. And finally, Given the government's trust in electric vehicles, there is a real need to accelerate the infrastructure creation for battery swapping and for charging for electric mobility. Not just for passengers, but also for freight, where the consumption is even higher. Our fourth idea is on tourism. We have chosen in this group to extend our infrastructure definition to include some of the soft infrastructure. Tourism. Our aspiration is to double tourist movement, domestic tourist movement, and triple foreign tourist arrivals in the country. India deserves to be at least in the top 10 on international tourism. Today we are ranked 40th. We are comparable to a country like Vietnam. China has 60 million tourists coming into the country compared to about 8 million into India. Why is this important? 
Tourism creates 78 jobs for every 10 lakh investment. It probably has the highest job creation multiplier in the country. One in 11 jobs in this country are related to the tourism sector. We think this should be taken on as a priority. We have four ideas. First, we recommend creating between five to seven tourism cluster zones in the country through the SPV model. We've identified a couple of these possibilities. We suggest that these SPVs be created as a public limited company with some overriding decision-making powers with independent CEOs, funded potentially 50% by state government and 50% by the central government. Second, we recommend an open door policy. We were surprised to learn that the visa fees for somebody coming into India today is in the region of 50 to 150 dollars. If you come in for a medical tourism visa, you pay 150 dollars. We did the math. Average tourist in India spends about three weeks. Even two nights of the GST on even two nights of hotel stay is more than enough to compensate for the visa fee for that person coming into India. So why don't we waive the visa fee for the next five years and open up our doors by waiving visa fee? Open and liberal sky policy and create aviation hubs. There is no reason why we should not aspire to make Delhi and Mumbai into an aviation hub. This requires us to create an anchor airline, but it can be done. We should follow and learn from what Dubai and Singapore have done. And finally, this might require us to actually promote even small-scale infrastructure creation, for example, hotels and so forth. That would require us to grant infrastructure status for investments more than 25 crores in this sector. Next idea. Our fifth idea is on health. Sabka swast, sabka vikas. Universal healthcare for all. Our vision is to provide universal holistic healthcare to all atropies two per day per person by 2022. We did the math and we looked at some of the schemes that are underplay in south of India and successful, and we think this can be done. We believe that India loses twice of what the government spends in pre-mortality losses. We spend about 40,000 crores as a government of India on health, and our estimate is we lose about 80,000 crores as an economy because of premature deaths. Interestingly, every hospital bed also generates 15 jobs. So it's a job creation opportunity. Four ideas. One is to leverage JAM as a way to actually provide where, with mobile becoming ubiquitous. And I don't need to tell this government and the prime minister on what the possibilities are. We are the journey is well begun. We envisage a new healthcare design by 2022 because as the economy grows, the healthcare cost can spiral out of control, like we have seen in the US. And we believe we need to create a different healthcare design and operating model in India. We discussed the need to declare health as an infrastructure sector in India. We need three and a half million beds to even meet basic standards. We need to double the skilled workforce in health in India. Finally, in order to realize this vision, we believe we need a few implementation enablers. We need to fix the branding and reputation for the sector, which is bad today. We believe there are many, much good work has been done by committees such as the Calcare Committee, which should be implemented. We need to maintain the sanctity of our contracts to give confidence to investors. We have a set of ideas around infrastructure financing. We believe there's a lot of global capital, but it is not coming into the country. There's an opportunity to relook at our infrastructure financing institution, better align investor needs with the project types we have in the country, leverage the balance sheet of the government to provide some relief on forex hedging for the industry to lower cost of capital. And finally, and very importantly, we believe there is need to empower and reform the bureaucracy by providing a safety net. There is a lot of concern on taking decisions and actions in a few areas, and we need to find ways to give them the security to move further. And finally, as was declared in the budget last year, we would like to revitalize and rethink the infrastructure through 3P India, which we think is a very worthwhile initiative. So in closing, dear Prime Minister, we are very excited about the opportunities in infrastructure and we are fully committed to help you on the journey to build the new India by 2022. Thank you. For an excellent presentation, this is Arvind Nadirata again. Now, one of the key things in under infrastructure is water, safe portable drinking water. If you look at around the country, the water table is dipping alarmingly. So what are your thoughts on having safe water 
available to every citizen, like you talked about electricity. In all honesty, we did not cover it, but I could not agree with you more. I think if you talk about the $5 trillion investment by 2030, uh, $1 trillion of that has to go into water. So it is probably the second road is a, bill, is a trillion, water is a trillion, and telecom is a trillion. So I think it is a very, very important area for us. And I'm not an expert, and we didn't spend time on it, but uh, it is clearly one of the top three or five things we need to get right. It's high time we made things like rainwater harvesting mandatory. I don't know if anybody on the panel wants to comment. I have nothing more to add. But. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I mean, while you all talked a lot about, you know, reform across distribution, but, you know, at the same time, there's a lot of infrastructure in our country in terms of, you know, you look at the stranded power assets, for instance, and where you know obviously a lot of money has gone into those. There's some money that's required to complete the projects, get them coal. So it would be useful to get some ideas from you as to you know how the private sector, working in conjunction with the government, can help to revive some of those projects. <coughs> no, I, I think Pankaj, that's a good question, of course, and it's a very current question right now, given all the issues that are happening. I think that, uh, look, there is no immediate uh, short-term solution to this. I think we've just built a lot of excess capacity on the thermal side. Uh, PLFs are very low, as we know. I think it will take time for that to get absorbed into the system. And I think it's only when that happens that some of the standard assets are going to get uh, dealt with. I think in the near term, there is no uh, short-term solution that we can find for this problem, I think. I'm Madan Padaki from uh, OneBridge. Uh, one of the infrastructure that we that probably that was discussed and not get covered is with with the huge technology revolution with IoT with with three D printing and whatever connectivity becomes a massive infrastructure required for the country at every nook and corner of the country in every village. So, any thoughts on uh, on on the connectivity itself as a fundamental infrastructure? I think we, we've covered every point of it uh, in the road connectivity, multimodal, we talked of freight, we've talked of aviation hubs, we've spoken of that and obviously all that goes into the hinterlands as well. I was talking about the technology connectivity. Ah, technology connectivity. Uh, Thank you, group. Thank you very much.